In 1899, Philip Peters and his wife had just bought a new house on a quiet street in Denver's middle north side. In an effort to make friends with the new neighbours, Mrs. Peters had agreed to host the local mandolin club's weekly practice session at their house. Strains of music could be heard from the street as participants began to warm up, eagerly anticipating the arrival of their teacher. Unbeknownst to them, young maestro Conies had already arrived. He stood outside the house, gazing through the parlour window, nothing but thoughts of jealousy and hatred coursing through him as he surveyed the happy little scene inside. The pallid, sickly-looking 17-year-old had been advised by the best physicians from Illinois to Colorado that the likelihood of him seeing his 18th birthday was practically nil. And as such, he felt a seething resentment towards Philip Peters for his obvious success and his perceived good health and life expectancy. He stepped onto the porch and rang the bell. There had been several occasions during the autumn of 1899 when the gangly youth, with the long slender fingers and darting eyes, had been the only guest at the Peters when they'd invited him to dine with them. He was extremely open with them, saying that he'd not finished high school, that his mother had forbade him from getting a proper job, and that he was probably going to die soon anyway. He shared memories from his boyhood about not being able to swing a bat and play ball for fear that the exertion would trigger a heart attack and how he loathed the people who'd stared and laughed at him for being different. His greatest wish had been to go and live alone somewhere remote where people couldn't mock him. In time, the Mandolin Club had run its course and eventually disbanded. Several years passed by, and on one snowy evening, as Phil Peters was leaving his work, he brushed shoulders with a shabby, slender-framed man. He realised with surprise that it was Coney's. Over dinner, the former maestro explained that his mother had been scammed out of their money by some men who had convinced her to invest in a mine in Illinois, only to disappear with all their savings. He said that he had an advertising job downtown and still lived with and looked after his mother. The next time Philip Peters saw Conies was in the spring of 1912. He talked about his mother's death and that he just kept on existing but didn't know what to do. He didn't mention the time he'd attempted to enrol in the army and been laughed out of the offices or the time he'd spent living under a bridge with the other hobos in California. The years went by, and by October 1941, Peters wasn't doing so well. His wife had broken her hip two weeks earlier and was recovering in the hospital. A friendly neighbour had been preparing dinners at her house for Philip Peters, and the 73-year-old pensioner had gone round every evening to collect the meals. One night, after he failed to show up, the neighbour grew concerned and went to check on him. When she rang the bell, there was no answer. She recruited a few people from the neighbourhood and went back. They tried three doors, all locked. A girl found one window screen was loose. She pried it open and then managed to squeeze inside. She disappeared into the dark house and moments later, a series of blood-curdling screams emanated from the window. Philip Peters, the kindly retired railroad auditor, was found murdered in the bungalow where he and his wife had lived for 50 years. When police arrived, they found his body in the bedroom. He was bloody, half-dressed, barefoot, and had been savagely beaten, with more than a dozen wounds to his skull. They found his watch and money lying in plain view on the dresser, which ruled out any consideration of robbery as a motive. Strangely, the front and back doors were still locked and bolted from the inside. Police found two cast iron shakers in the kitchen, one newly cleaned, and next to it, a damp towel 
with blood stains on it. January of 1942 was bitterly cold. Temperatures fell below zero for several days in a row. Neighborhood kids reported seeing a dim light on inside the house, and another neighbor said she'd seen a ghostly face peering through a window. The house quickly established a reputation for being haunted. Once the widow Peter's hip had recovered, she decided to return to the little house, which had been her home for 50 years. One night, a strange noise startled her, and she fell, refracturing her thigh. She did not want to go back to hospital, so instead, a live-in nurse was hired. And then one night, the nurse reported that she'd heard scraping noises and rattling coming from inside the walls of the house. A cursory investigation uncovered nothing, but then a few days later, in the dead of night, she came face to face with an apparition on the back stairs that, in her words, bore a terrifying expression before chuddering its teeth at her and disappearing. The nurse resigned immediately, and a caring neighbour stepped in to take care of Mrs. Peters. A couple of days later, the neighbour, hearing a mysterious sound, hurried into the kitchen to investigate, and was confronted by what she described as a filthy, wraith-like thing that vanished when she screamed. The police decided to keep a closer watch on the house, and, at the insistence of concerned relatives, Mrs. Peters moved into her son's house in western Colorado. It was now July 1942, and two men from the Denver Police Department were stationed on a lookout across the street from the Peters' home early one morning. They watched the postman coming up the street, delivering to each house. One of the men happened to look back towards the Peters' house and caught a glimpse of a wizened, creepy face peering out of the window from between two curtains. He elbowed the other man, who glanced towards the house and saw only the slight movement of a curtain fluttering at the window. The two policemen took off across the street, blowing their whistles for assistance. There was no trace of the face at the window as they broke down the front door and charged inside the property. Inside, the furniture was swathed in dust sheets Old newspapers lay on the table. Above the piano, they noticed a painting mounted on the wall, a portrait from the late 90s featuring a frail, sickly-looking boy sitting in the foreground clutching a mandolin. One of the officers heard a door creak upstairs. He bounded up the stairwell and into a bedroom, just in time to see a closet door close. He ran to the closet and opened the door, where he saw two thin, pale legs disappearing into the ceiling. Instinctively, he grabbed the ankles and pulled as hard as he could, causing the mysterious figure to fall from the hatch it had been trying to crawl into and crash to the floor. Lying in front of the officer was the body of an unconscious man dressed in tattered clothes. The police chief who arrived at the scene said, quote, the strangest looking human I had ever seen. A tall man, about six foot, but as thin as a wilted weed. His dirty hair hung low over his ears, and his skin was the ugly, unwashed grey of an overcast sky. The man was taken into custody and identified as 59 year old Theodore Conies. He revealed to police that he had broken into the Peters' house initially in September of 1941 to steal some food when nobody was home. Whilst looking around, he discovered the small hatch above the closet and decided to crawl inside and sleep. Conies told police that, due to his poor health, he decided to remain in the Peters' attic. He said that at first he would remain quiet whenever Philip was home and would venture out to steal food when he left. But after a while, he became bolder and started to come down when Philip was home. He said that he would play games, stalking him from room to room, just to see if he could. On the night of the murder, Coney's thought that Peters had gone out and came down to steal some food. Peters, however, 
was home, and when he caught Conies in the kitchen, he attacked and bludgeoned the old man to death before retreating back to the safety of the attic. Police searched the house, even pausing to tap on the underside of the hatch in the closet as Coney sat feet away on the other side, but concluded that it was far too small for anyone to be able to fit through it. When they finally searched the space Coney's had called home for the last nine months, they discovered that it measured a mere 27 by 57 inches, barely more than a coffin. Inside, they found a small ironing board he'd adapted for a bed, tattered magazines, and one incandescent bulb hanging from the ceiling. The space reeked of urine and excrement, and it was completely covered with spiderwebs. Thanks to this final detail, Coney's would forever become known as the Spider-Man of Denver. Think of the times you've heard a strange sound in your own home and told yourself it was just the house settling, the wind, your cat, or simply your imagination. Next time, pay closer attention. Oh, and don't forget to check your attic. Hi, I'm Zoe, and thank you for watching this edition of 10 Minute Spin It. Don't forget to check out the other videos on my channel and hit that subscribe button for future uploads. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.